John 19 this morning, as you saw read this morning uh, in the text that appeared on the screen, the narration. Uh, I, I have been gone for four weeks because our elders are very kind to give me uh, four weeks from preaching so I can do some study and get ahead of the game, if you will, do some reading and some research. And as much as I love preaching, that break is really fun and necessary, and I appreciate it. And I'm even more grateful for Drake Holderman, who's one of our student ministers, and for Michael DeFazio, who's a professor at Ozark and one of the members here of our church who filled in those four weeks, and you bet, they did really, really well. Now, we're going to erase the clapping out of the tape so they don't hear this, okay? We just, <laughs> ego, you know, I want to protect ego. But they did fantastic. Let me tell you where they were, because I know a lot of people travel uh, during those four weeks, the holidays, the lake, and all that's going on. So let me catch you up to speed so you know where we are today. Uh, Drake began by taking us in that moment that Chip talked about a little bit early, earlier. When they left the upper room, they headed toward the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was going to spend a night in prayer knowing what was about to occur to him. And Drake led us through that passage in John 17, where Jesus prayed for us in advance. On a night he should have only been praying for his own safety, he spent those hours praying for you and I that we would always remember the sacrifice he made and why he made it. And then in week two, Drake brought us into Jesus' prayer where faced with what was about to happen, the soldiers coming to get him, Jesus prayed to the Father, if there's any other way, and God remained silent, Jesus said, not my will, but yours. And then in week three, Michael came in and he talked about Judas. And I loved the hook that he used as a memory device. He said, it could have been me. And when I heard that, I was convicted. I, was, I know where I was in Michigan when I was walking, listening to his sermon, and I thought, holy smokes, it was me. How many times I've betrayed Jesus for my own kingdom. And then last week, Michael took us to the beginning of the trials. Jesus is arrested by the Roman soldiers. Peter, who vows to be faithful to him forever, bolts and runs for his life and fulfills the prophecy that Jesus said that he wasn't strong enough on his own. And then he appears in these series of trials before the high priest, Caiaphas and Annas. He appears before Pilate, who we'll talk about today, and then he goes to King Herod. And in all of these moments, he is abused, he is mistreated, it's unjust, it's unfair, it's not right. In all these moments, Jesus kept his eye on the prize, which was to free you and I from what he got we deserved. And so Jesus endured it for us. And in the Matthew chapter 27, verse 22, Pilate who we'll talk about this morning, asks a question of himself and of the crowd. He says, what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? And it's a question that I want every one of us to ponder this morning, and we will. It's not just Pilate's question, it's the question of every life. What are you really doing with Jesus who is the Messiah? It's not an indictment, it's an awakening. And I hope you'll receive it that way, that you'll be inspired to understand for yourself who Jesus is. Because Pilate makes three very common mistakes in how he deals with Jesus during the trial. See, this answer provides the insight into who Pilate is. Pilate was a very powerful man. He had authority, he had position, and he had means of enacting his authority to accomplish what he wants. But the truth of the matter is, if I can quote my 14-year-old son who says this a lot around me, Pilate was famous for a hot minute, and then he wasn't. I know it's uncool for someone my age to use that, but I liked it. You see, in the scope of history, Pilate had his moment, and then he didn't, and it was gone. If you looked at the juxtaposition of what's taking place here between these two men, you find something fascinating. You have a proud Roman with authority, and you have a humble Jew with none. You have a man of power versus a man of submission. You have a man who puts his everything into today, and you have another man who has nothing today so he can invest everything in eternity. This is on the grand scale, an unfair battle, and the loser wins. It's the gospel narrated in a moment. But Pilate does three things that I do, and I hope this isn't offensive, but I think you might too. Which is why when we're done, we have to ask and answer ourselves this question. What am I going to do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? The first is Jesus cannot be passively dealt with. One of Pilate's choices here is he makes no choice. He wants everyone else to make the choice for him. And that's common, isn't it? Living by grandmother's faith or participating in church because mom and dad want you to. Or going because it's good for the kids. No, it's not good for the kids if it's not real at home. We just teach to pretend. Faith has to be displayed individually. God's not going to ask a crowd. He's not going to ask what church you went to. 
He's going to ask, what did you do with the gift I gave you in Jesus? The forgiveness of your sins and entrance into my kingdom. What did you do with the offer of a lifetime? But here's how Pilate deals with it. Verse 1, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now remember, let me give you the background. He's already met with Pilate one time before, and Pilate will pass him off. I'll explain in a moment. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him with the purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officers saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answers, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis of charge against him. Pilate is trying to get anybody but himself to make the declaration of who Jesus is. He sends him to Herod because Herod oversees the Jews for the Romans. So he sends him to King Herod and Herod has no clue what to do with Jesus. He wants him to perform. He asks Jesus to perform a miracle. Jesus refuses to perform a miracle. He's already done enough and miracles didn't produce faith. So, so Herod sends him back to Pilate. Pilate didn't want this. Pilate wanted Herod to deal with it because Pilate didn't want to mess with it. So then he tries to get the people to decide. He asks them. And over and over he states the claim. Three different times. Listen to him. Chapter 18, verse 38. I find no fault in him at all. 19.4. Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Verse 6. You take him and crucify him for I find no fault in him. If you find no fault in him, then find no fault. But he keeps passing it off to everybody else. He's passively dealing with Jesus. He's letting others tell him who he is instead of going with what he knows in his heart, who Jesus truly is. So he thinks, I'll torture Jesus, and they'll take pity on him. I'll let the crowd see that they know there's nothing wrong with him. I know there's, he's done nothing wrong. He doesn't deserve this. But instead, because Pilate is, is mercenary, he has Jesus pummeled. And I have to say this, and I hope I don't offend anybody because that's not my intention, but I grew up in the church. I grew up in the flannel graph era where they danced Jesus across this felt thing and they posted pictures. I didn't grow up in the veggie tail area, praise God. I grew up in the area where there were these graphics. But the graphics of Jesus, they were unfair. They were wrong. They were improper. Jesus had a scratch on his face and a little bit of blood on the corner from the but his, he was covered, and he was healthy, and he was good, and I understand why they painted those pictures, but I want you to know, it's not what happened to him. I won't even go into deep detail because there are children in the room, and that's a conversation that when you parents are ready to have with your children, I hope you do, but Jesus wasn't just abused. Jesus was tortured and brutalized. He had him flogged. Now, we don't even know what that means except the depiction in the Roman annals are this. They would find a post or a rock, and they would strap the person over that, pulling their body limbs as tight as they could so the skin was exposed and as tight and the muscles were exposed. They would take this wood stick with leather straps that they wet. They'd put glass or metal or rocks on the end of that. And when your body was torn off, just imagine reaching over and grabbing your ankles. That hurts to even think about that, nevertheless. And there you are, fully exposed, and someone whips this across your body and sinks those pieces of glass, lead, or rock into your flesh and then shreds it across over and over, 39 times. The Romans had three levels of flogging. According to what the research indicates, this was the worst kind. And it was known as the death before the death. 30% of the people that were beaten like this by Roman soldiers died before they were ever crucified. Because it opened internal organs, it opened the... The membrane, it opened the nerve endings. It exposed you to massive bleeding, shock, and death. So that's the picture of this Jesus they brought out. So Herod wouldn't make the decision, and the crowd wanted him dead. So Pilate decides, I'm just going to beat him up so badly that they'll show pity on him. And then they put a purple robe on him. Now, I used to always think about this. If you ever had an open wound, the last thing you want is a big wool-heavy garment laid on top of that open wound with all the nerve endings and everything else exposed. But I didn't realize until I was watching a documentary last night that I learned something and made my tail wag. So I got new information. Purple was the color that the Roman kings wore before the republic. The kingdom, the kingship was taken away when the republic was formed, like America. That it was run, run by a senate and by elected officials who would choose rather than a king. But the Roman kings wore purple. 
I'm told that when Julius Caesar became dictator, the first thing he did to make, to make the crowds aware of his intention was he walked out in a purple robe. So when a Roman put a purple robe on somebody, they were declaring him what? King. Pilate puts a purple robe on the exposed, shredded back of our king to mock him and to say to the Jews, he is your king. And in this moment, he puts him in front of the crowd and it incites the crowd even worse. And he says, behold the man. The reason I'm not angry at my Sunday school teachers, but the reason it created a false image for me is I want you to hear the words of Isaiah 52 when the prophet described what Jesus most likely looked like. And many were appalled at him because his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form was marred more than human likeness. He didn't look human when they walked him on that stage in front of the crowd covered in a purple robe with the crown of thorns on his head. Jesus was not just abused. Jesus was brutalized. And he stood before the crowd and there was no mercy. You see, you don't have to be opposed to Jesus to be against him. Just be passive. Just let the world treat him like he doesn't deserve. The second thing we learn about Pilate's reaction is Jesus can't be fearfully dealt with. Now, maybe you're not just disinterested or passive about Jesus, but maybe you're just a little scared about if you really treated him like he deserves to be treated, it would change your world. Let me tell you, it will change your world. Verse 7, the Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Now think about his physical condition right now. This is a fact. But also think about the audacity of Pilate looking at the God of the universe saying, I'm bigger than you. With one word, with a look, Jesus could have vaporized this man and exposed him for exactly how little power he had. But he doesn't. He doesn't even say a word. If he'd have said the right words, he would have been freed. Pilate was looking for a reason to release him. Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. And why didn't he? I'm kind of grateful deep inside he didn't, because his sacrifice paid for my price. But I'm also heartbroken by the fact that Jesus didn't deserve anything he received that day. Yet he did it because you and I did deserve it. Verse 7, the Jews insisted he claims to be the Son of God. That's what made Pilate scared. In the research, I discovered this, that Romans believed that the gods could come to earth and walk amongst them. That's why they had the, uh, the pantheon. That's why they had the, the belief in the mythological gods, Venus, and so forth. Yet, I don't believe that's probably the prior motivation for Pilate's response. I think his greater motivation, his greatest fear was, what if Tiberius finds out? He's the second Caesar after Augustus. Tiberius was a recluse. He was paranoid. He killed anybody who he thought even had bad thoughts or didn't want him to be their Caesar. And so there's no way Pilate's going to present this guy as king up against Tiberius and have Tiberius find out about it because that's just loyalty. So he's scared, listen to me, he's scared for his own position. He's scared for his own authority. He's scared for his own power. And many of us are not truthfully pursuing Jesus because we're scared what it'll cost us. We're scared it will cost us our power, our position, our money, our fame, our place. So we can be somebody for a hot minute, and then we're not. You see, Jesus says, I call it for all of it from you. So why didn't Jesus open his mouth? Why didn't he say what needed to be said? Why didn't he claim the truth? You see, he never lies. He just doesn't speak. Why? Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before that is silent before its shears, so he opened not his mouth. He chose to remain silent, knowing what that would cost him. And yet he asks us to pay a cost too, and we wonder if it's enough. You see, you don't have to be opposed to Jesus to be against him. Just be passive. And you don't have to be ignorant of who Jesus is to be against him. Just be afraid. Because Pilate knew and could not respond, would not respond because of his fear, and he was hoping somebody else would take the blame. 
And thirdly, Jesus can't be selfishly dealt with. Verse 12. But the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement. It was the day of preparation, a Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. And they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate said? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And can you imagine that all the prophecies of God about the adulterous relationship that Israel had with the world came true that day when they said, he's not our king, Caesar's our king. Yet what did they hope the Messiah would do? Free them from the reign of Rome. But Rome was providing them something that Jesus wasn't, a sense of protection, a sense of place, a sense of status, a sense of power for a moment, and then not. And they cried out, we have no king but Caesar. Verse 16, finally Pilate handed, them over, handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. At that moment, it was over. There was no recourse. There was no doing the right thing. His selfishness, his position, his fear, his passivity, all of it brought about the unjust death of a great man. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. We have a king. His name's Caesar. We need to be careful. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said, whoever would be a friend of this world will become the enemy of God. And so we stop our story today. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'll say it before you do. It's a terrible place to end a sermon. Where's the hope? Where's the gospel? Where's the truth? Well, we know, don't we? If you pay attention to the evidence, we know what's coming. But let us never forget the price paid to get us there. Let us never just float through life like Walt Disney wrote every one of the Bible stories. He didn't. This ends tragically because a man refused to answer his own question, what will I do with this man named Jesus who is the Messiah? And by not answering it, he allowed an innocent man to suffer so he could protect himself. And Pilate's name will go down in history as a failure. A man working so hard to create a legacy and a name for himself gave it all away because he didn't have an answer to the question, but he knew the answer. He just wouldn't answer it. What will I do with this, Jesus? Luke, in his telling of this particular moment, says, and the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. The world had too much of Pilate's attention to answer his own question. So I think it's fair, is it not, to ask ourselves the same question this morning? Who is our king? What will we do with this King Jesus who proclaims himself the Messiah, who is evidenced by his miracles, evidenced by the truth of his teaching, and evidenced by the resurrection? Who evidenced his love for us on the cross? In a world that doesn't want to believe that God's wrath is real? How can we have a loving God and a wrathful God? This is not a complete explanation, but let me whet your appetite. And this is from a flawed human being. There are several people in my family I have a wife and two sons and a daughter-in-law, and if you harmed one of them, my love for them would produce a wrath. God's wrath comes from his love, not from a, a broken character. It's not like God's out to smite. But God's love for us becomes furious at evil and what evil has done to his family and his children. And he strikes out against evil. So he sent Jesus to show us how evil evil is on the cross. And yet we dismiss it like, well, good for him. He did this for us. No, no. We need to weigh the moment of the crucifixion. Next week, we're going to ask and answer the question. Or we're going to show what we did to him. And the following week, if you come back, we're going to show what he did for us on the cross so that we can have these next three weeks of introspection. So yes, I can offer you the good news of the gospel, but I don't know if it'll ever become good news until you and I understand the bad news of evil and the bad news of sin. Sin is not an irritation, it's a cancer, and it kills our souls. So in an awkward moment, 
I'm just going to ask you to spend the week thinking. Turn something off so you can turn something on inside yourself. And spend some time in the Word of God, imagining if Jesus had done what was best for him, how our histories would be changed. But instead, he did what was best for us. Now he's asking us to do what's best for him. And will we offer him that same thing? What will we do with this man named Jesus who is the Messiah? We're going to ask you just to spend a few moments. Some questions are going to come up on the screen, and we're going to give you just a little bit of time to ponder through this on your own. Have a conversation with the Lord as you think through what will you do with this man.